So, Marcelo has uh, covered the first part of the tutorial that uh, taken into perspective took the first uh, four uh, steps in this uh, method for uh, uh, turning a conceptual BPMN model into a, uh, an executable one. And uh, those, let's say, are the those four tasks, four first steps led us to a to be executed process model, which, uh, you know, you it's like to be executed, but you cannot execute it yet because it's missing a lot of uh, metadata, let's call it, from the conceptual model perspective, that it will be needed by a business process management system in order to uh, 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 get it automated. Uh, and you may wonder, why is the tutorial so in balance? Why is it that four steps in you know one hour and 20 minutes and one step in one and a half hours uh, well, it's partly because I speak slower and not as loud as Marcello. <laughs> I guess so. that has something to play. This, that, that, that plays a role. But it also has to be, it also has to do with the fact that, in fact, specifying execution properties is kind of much, much more than we can think at first glance. Uh, so there are quite a few properties you need to specify. For example, uh, you need to specify what uh, variables, data variables, were your process manipulating its working memory, uh, what messages the process needs to receive and send, uh, what uh, signals are raised within the process, uh, what uh, types of errors can occur. Some of them are already in the to be executed <coughs> model, but some system related errors are not yet there. Um, uh, which, uh, for every task in the process, and we're talking about a process that might have you know, 20, 30 tasks. Uh, we need to think about what are the inputs of that tasks and uh, what, what data is consumed by the task in a way or taken as input by the task and what data is produced upon completion of the task. And we need to then take the tasks of the process and the tasks of each task, the variables of the process and the inputs and outputs of the task and map them together. We need, if we have service tasks, we need to specify the details or bindings behind those services. Uh, if we have a script task, we need to put in code snippets. Uh, we have, if we have user tasks, if there are people who perform that task, so we need to link the process model to the organizational model, you know, roles and people inside. Um, a, a, we need to define a bunch of uh, business rules. Uh, the most common of them are the, the ones that, call, that go in our decision points, in our XOR splits or OR splits. Uh, and, uh, uh, and then a, f a bunch of other stuff dealing with the user interface in case the user interface is going to be uh, encoded directly into the BPMS, uh, you know, the structure of the work queues, and, uh, and you can keep going, but at some point in time I'm going to stop and just show you a demo. So this part uh, of the tutorial will, will first, uh, I will first tell you something about uh, uh, business process management systems. Uh, because that's the target platform, you know, our, our goal is to take a to be executed model and pull in a business process management system, so I, I kind of need to talk a bit about the architecture of the business process management systems. Then um, I will briefly uh, discuss different business process management systems and we can discuss some trade-off between them and uh, uh, we are going to then, I'm going to then show you how you specify all these execution properties that I showed you on the previous slide in a particular BPMS. So uh, uh, there are many, many, many business process management systems. There are many architectures of business process management systems. Again, if you type architecture of business process management system, you will get like on Google images, you will get all sorts of architectures ranging from three boxes to 30 boxes, your choice. Uh, we kind of have kind of settled for one that we have validated by looking at many BPMS and trying to match them against the architecture of those BPMS and it kind of captures at least the essence of all these architectures. So, so you can see it as a common, common thing. Uh, every uh, BPMS that we know about, or probably that you know about, will have a process modeling tool, right? Uh, and this uh, process modeling tool might be the same that uh, the business process uh, uh, analyst will have used. So for example, uh, you can have a BPMS like Visagi, and it has a modeler, and it has the execution engine, uh, the, the business process management system itself, and uh, there are business analysts who use the Visagi process modeler in their daily life, 
and those same models can then be easily imported into the, the business process management uh, engine. Um, but there are, uh, all, in other cases, you know, people will be, business process analysts will be modeling in Signavio, for example, which is a pure, or ARIS, pure, uh, say, process modeling tools and analysis tools uh, that do not, are not tied to a, 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 an engine, and therefore they will uh, uh, export, the, you will export your, either your conceptual process model or your to be executed process model from your tools, depending on your choice, and you will Push it, pull it into your uh, ex uh, business process management engine. Uh, and uh, uh, for example, uh, uh, let's take Bonita Soft as a particular open commercial open source business pro process management system will have its own its called so called studio, which includes a process modeling editor where you can put in your you know, design, your BPM and model, and you can start enriching it with uh, information to make it executable, everything in the same environment, right? But in other cases, you will design your process more on a different tool and import it here. Regardless of what you, you do, in addition to this tool being a business process modeling tool, it has a bunch of screens that allows you to specify properties on the tasks, on the events, on the gateways to make this process model uh, executable. Uh, as I kind of alluded to before, one of the uh, perhaps most time-consuming parts is specifying for every task and, and every event, uh, the so-called, I call them input and output mappings. Some call it inbound and outbound mappings, which means the mapping between the variables, let's call it the data model of the process itself as a whole, and the input and output parameters of the task. So that will be specified differently in different tools. You know, some tools will use XPath, some tools will use some uh, dot navigation, dot notations, but in any case, they will basically allow you to link the variables that are defined at the level of the process to the variables that are defined at the level of one particular task, and you will do that for every task. And all these annotation process, I annotating your process model with <coughs> EG uh, input and output mappings will be integrated together with the process modeling editor. Because of that, it is usually the case, uh, my experience, that uh, a business process analysts find that these editors, business process modeling editors, that come embedded into the BPMS are not user friendly for them. You know, they are too complex, there are too many things they don't want to see. And that creates the situation where you have on the one hand business process modeling tools and on the other hand uh, business process management systems that have an embedded business process modeling tool inside. That's, in my experience, one of the most common scenarios. So, you know, arguably one of the most uh, used or widely commercialized um, business process modeling tools will be ARIS uh, or business process uh, logician or uh, you know smaller players like Signavio, there are lots of them uh, and uh, they are purely on the process modeling marketing targeting business people and uh, and the uh, engine the editors of business process modeling uh, uh, business process management systems typically are, are not used by these uh, set of users. Uh, the second component in the architecture is, of course, the execution engine. That is the heart of the BPMS. There, uh, that's when the process model is already executable. It gets deployed into the execution engine, and the execution engine is routing tasks to different other parts, to people, through, through <coughs> forms, through work lists, sorry, uh, to services, and so on. So it's responsible for, let's say, determining every time an event related to the business process occurs, uh, determining what is the new state of the business process, what are the tasks that are enabled, and pushing the, those tasks to uh, different people and different applications. Um, the next component is the work list handler. Uh, this is the component that is essentially responsible for um, managing instances of tasks. So in your process model, there are tasks, 
Uh, and when you are in a certain state, certain tasks become enabled, meaning ready to be executed. And at that moment in time, they are pushed into the work list handler. And the work list handler is managing, uh, will determine if it is a user task. And there is a form associated to it that will produce a form, gather data. When the data is submitted, I will uh, declare that this task instance is completed. And I will push back the completed task instance together with the data that was collected back into the execution engine. So it's two-way communication happening between the execution engine and uh, the work list handler. Yeah. Typically embedded in a, in a work list handler, there will be a, a web form generator. This is typical view of a work list handler. Just for consistency, we took the same uh, tool, Bonita Soft. Uh, and uh, you will see that, uh, you know, it looks like a, a task handler. Like, you know, there are tasks, uh, for example, organized by uh, a, a due dates, you know, because you can, in most business process management uh, systems, when you do your to be executed process model, you can attach uh, expected durations or maximum durations for every task. And then that way, the, the work list handler can calculate uh, the, ex the, the due dates for tasks and can do escalation when something goes overdue. It will put in an overdue queue and it will start shouting to everybody, you know, that something should be done about it. And depending on the, the tool, there can be some, some tools will be uh, pretty sophisticated and will provide uh, social networking capabilities. Like, for example, um, uh, there will be tools that will allow you to, um, uh, to see uh, who performed all the previous task instances in this process and uh, to put in comments on your tasks that other people can see and you know to, to kind of start communicating with these other participants in the same instance of the process and uh, the final the next component basically is and, and the final internal component is the administration and uh, monitoring uh, tool uh, that is the, the observer of the whole system. It's, you know, it can grab all the events that are logged by the execution engine because the execution engine is constantly logging everything that is happening and can produce all sorts of dashboards, beautiful dashboards. In that respect, this is a, tip, a dashboard from BPM1, which is another business process management system. In that respect, uh, um, typically tools will have two types of dashboards, right? Uh, one of them it will be a business, typically called a business activity monitoring or BAM dashboard. That one is monitoring the process instances that are currently active. Uh, like for example, here we see a view with uh, all the tasks that are currently, the, the queue of every participant in the process uh, with some red to indicate that this task assigned to this person is overdue. And, uh, uh, and, and, a bond, and and this is being updated like uh, you know continuously, right? Uh, and uh, some perhaps more higher end business process management systems will also have a business analytics dashboard, business process analytics dashboard. Um, actually, this is not one of them, unfortunately. This is also a, a business uh, a runtime one. It's telling you the, the current status of different tasks. But some, 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 this same tool, IBM BPM Process Portal, will have another type of dashboard where you can see, uh, a, you can get reports on process instant, on history of process executions, those that have completed. And you can do all sorts of reports from them. And there is some sort of uh, borderline there between process mining tools and business process analytics tools. That, you know, it's just non-empty intersection because, for example, both of them uh, have a functionality related to business performance measurement. You know, they are measuring the performance of different actors in the process and so on. And depending on how sophisticated it gets, at some point in time, somebody starts calling it like a process mining tool or something. Like that, right? <coughs> uh, also, behind the behind the scenes, not shown here, uh, is the 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 admin console, which typically you know is integrated with the, the business uh, monitoring functionality, uh, the administration console basically allows you to administrate or manage the processes that are deployed, and see the list of cases and act upon if something goes wrong. It's also typically used by developers for testing purposes, and I'll be using one of those you know, to 
artificially start a new case and start doing some testing with it. Uh, and uh, let's say there are components that are external to the business process management system but are involved also in the execution of processes and those are typically abstracted away in the form of external services uh, and the execution engine whenever it has some service task and that's where the name <coughs> comes from will uh, push uh, data or pull data from uh, these uh, external services. Uh, one of the most common external services and every BPMS will come with a number of predefined service templates uh, and one of the common one is uh, the, the, the rules uh, engine you know so, so business process management systems typically come connected with one or several business process have connectors with one or several business process management engines say it rules where you will store certain business rules that are required to at uh, different points in the process right uh, some there is a discussion in this respect uh, uh, that is a, a debate that is kind of in my opinion a bit not settled which is like when do you when you have an XOR split in a process that requires some condition to be evaluated when do you put that condition in the ex, in the in the arcs of the XOR split and when do you rather put a business rule event that pushes the evaluation of this condition to an external business rules management system where you keep all your business rules together, not only these branching point decision rules, but also all sorts of other business rules that your company might have. So, so that is uh, a matter where there are uh, different points of views, and some people will say push everything to the business rules engine, some people will say no, 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 try to put as much as possible into the business process management system. Uh, and different trade-offs between the two. But this is, in any case, an example of some external system tied to the business process management system through a service interface. Uh, other types of typical service templates that a business process management system will give you are uh, adapter services that allow you to, uh, intermediate services that allow you, the BPMS, to, to uh, pull data from a database, for example. So database adapters, there will be all sorts of database adapters. And of course, adapters to mainstream enterprise resource planning systems. So there will be adapters for a, you know, SAP or Oracle, etc. in your typical business process management system. Uh, for those ones, they will make you pay per piece. Right. Uh, so that's pretty much what a business process management system is. Now let me talk specifically about a few business process management systems. So, so there has been quite a lot of them. Back in 2003, uh, Michael Surmulen wrote his uh, PhD thesis, which appeared as a book. And in there, he had a diagram along these lines, uh, telling, kind of narrating the story of uh, workflow management systems, as it was called back at the time, from early 90s, you know, until 2003, right? And it was like full, was much larger than this one. It was full of, of different business process management, of workflow management systems uh, that you have, the younger generation has never heard of. Uh, one of them, for example, is Staffware, you know, that will be, you know, at that time was one of the, the market uh, leaders or perceived market leaders in the area of workflow management systems. Uh, uh, but some of them that are here are also legacy from those times. Um, and, uh, and at the time it was like a constellation, you know, it's like, you know, not like, like a random piece of the sky, you know, there was points all over the place. What, um, uh, with the, let's say, the advent of the concept of, or not the advent of the concept of business process management system, but as a, a, a commercial vendors started to switch from the notion of workflow management system to a broader notion of business process management systems. What we have observed is a continuous trend to consolidation. Uh, so you will see that uh, the, especially the big vendors have gone very, very aggressive in, uh, you know, shooting at everything that moves uh, and, uh, you know, starting by the people at the top there. Uh, and, uh, and by now, basically, we have a situation where there are probably less uh, business process management systems, you know, let's say, actually maintained than it used to, to be the case. Um, 
and uh, we can classify in this respect business process management systems on the one hand according to whether the let's say their their business model is it a closed source business model or an open source business model and uh, in the closed source business models essentially now there has been a lot of consolidation many of the dots you saw before are in the hands of IBM which itself consolidated a lot it's offering it had like pretty much 2.5 or 3 this process management systems now they have a single one called IBM BPM uh, which uh, I've been told I haven't tried it myself yet but I've been told it's much easier to use than its predecessors uh, Oracle has <coughs> always been active in there and has had actually several products as well because they, they acquired at some point in time but they have consolidated around their whole Oracle BP business process management suite uh, Microsoft still has two parallel threads the Windows Workflow Foundation, sorry for the misspell, and uh, their larger, you know, uh, uh, tool set called BizTalk, uh, which is not only about business process management, but, you know, business intelligence and everything uh, that starts with business. Uh, SAP has been, uh, has, has had several workflow engines over time, uh, but uh, since, uh, let's say, they bought into BPMN, they settled for a single one, say the, the one that they promote the most, which is Subnet Weaver BPM, which is used in quite a few SAP installations. But uh, one thing you will never see, it's not a business process management system like per se, in the sense that you will never see it used outside this, this, the SAP environment. Um, a software AG, you know, this big, big company acquired web methods and that's, yeah, they have settled for that, there are a few more. There are other smaller vendors. They have remained despite all this, uh, you know, acquisition war that has been. So they are the survivors of the acquisition war, or they are sufficiently large that you know they don't get acquired. Uh, and uh, that includes Appian, uh, Visagi, which is the one I'm going to show today, and so on. Um, and in the commercial source, in the open source arena. Well, it is very usually, uh, uh, it's usually we, we usually distinguish between two types of open source, right? And it's a commercial open source where there is one company clearly behind it and they kind of uh, control the code, and control who commits to it, and they, they, they typically operate in the form like I put some sort of community edition in open source and then the more advanced features with my fancy adapters to different database and enterprise systems, I keep it aside and I start uh, uh, selling those parts. Uh, in that area we will find Bonita Soft, uh, Camunda, uh, Italia, which is not as strong as it used to be, uh, JBPM, which uh, you know was uh, the, the first uh, a, a venture of uh, Tom Bayens whom we heard today. Uh, and Camunda Fox, which is also, Camunda Fox is like uh, some sort of split in a way from activity, which is the second venture that Tom Bayens had had in that space. Uh, what there is not a lot, um, and this is a very general observation in the field of enterprise software, is community open source. You know, open source that is there, uh, you know, mainly on the basis of volunteering. You know, no, people are making some money, of course, but you know, they are volunteering. Uh, uh, that. Uh, a, a, is built by a community of people more or less without direct interest, you know, with, or with soft uh, commercial interests. Uh, and typically with a per permissive license like uh, a, a Apache uh, or, so, or <coughs> MIT. Uh, that will, there's not a lot remaining there. There used to be, that column used to be much longer, but you will see a lot of projects that simply died. And it's, a, it's, a, it's typical because uh, I would say on the one hand, business process is an asset that uh, customers, organizations are not willing to pull out too much. They want to keep them as confidential as possible. You know, so getting support from a community without telling them what my processes are is a bit hard. Uh, and uh, uh, so, so there is, it's very difficult to, to the contact with the real users is very <coughs> difficult to manage in that context. It's, I think it's one of the main uh, factors uh, behind the lack of actors in that space. But YOL, one, you know, some of you have probably played around with, it's an example of, say, a BPMS on that end, since that it has pretty much all the components that a BPMS has. 
uh, talking about YOL, which is not based on BPMN, we can also uh, uh, classify business process management systems into pure or also called native BPMN systems. You know, these are systems that were designed to support uh, BPMN as a standard. Uh, IBM BPM is a complete rebuild of uh, uh, previous uh, IBM offerings, uh, supporting uh, BPMN and Camunda Fox is another example. Um, uh, there is, these are tools that uh, that uh, can import your BPMN from any BPMN compliant tool that will produce their output in BPMN, and that you know use BPMN all throughout. There are some tools that I would call adapted BPMN, typically tools that kind of developed pretty much at the time that BPMN 1.01.1 have just popped up. Uh, and as the standard evolved, they, they did not kept 100% compliance, but they are pretty more or less there. Uh, Visagi, which is the tool that I'm going to show today, is one example. So it doesn't support uh, a import of standard serial BPMN XML files and doesn't export to that. That's a few other disadvantages, but it has other advantages as well. And then there are a few known, still some non BPMN uh, BPMS around. Uh, YOL is an example of that. You know, they just stick to their own issue. Okay, uh, that's what I wanted to see to say on the blah 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 side. I'm going now to move into demo mode, so maybe it's a good time to ask questions. Uh, and if not, I have a question for you. Do you want to ask me first? Yes. My question, my question, yeah. yeah. So, uh, I guess there is a lot of people here teaching using BPMS, right? So I think it's a very good occasion for us to exchange ideas, you know, uh, about which BPMS is best for different purposes, you know, commercial purposes if you are into it, or teaching purposes. Uh, I have tried uh, basically three. Uh, we started. I started teaching with YOL many years ago, at the time that YOL was just started, just because, whatever, my name was there probably, and uh, I had to shout YOL, 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 so I was using YOL. It's very lightweight for teaching purposes, it's great, there's a, you know, study version, you know, you, you can get it working extremely quickly, uh, has a very lightweight exchange format, you know, you can send the files left and right, put them in a version control repository, uh, it's uh, it's uh, it, it's very portable because it's pure Java based, so I can run it in my Mac, which is something I cannot say of all the tools, uh, and I can deploy on pretty much any server, uh, and uh, it worked pretty well for me. Except that you know BPMN became so big in my face that I could not ignore it, right? I could not leave it aside. So so I, I had at some point time to move into a BPMN based. At that time, I tried a few of the IBM products, extremely heavy stuff. I've been told that IBM BPM has become better in that respect, and it was so difficult to set it up, and you know, it was going to explode on your head, and you know, every uh, it felt that it was going to explode on your head, and the students would start to cry after five minutes. So I stopped that one, but that was pre-IBM BPM, by the way. Uh, and then I settled down for uh, Visagi, and that has been a tool that for my teaching has worked pretty well. It's, it's not too large, it's uh, you know, very quick install, it's easy to get going, and it has a, a very intuitive kind of interface, that wizard style that guides you through, through the construction of process models, and I kind of teach Visagi, BPMS, and then Visagi in about, uh, you know, three weeks of lecturing, so, you know, like, like first a bit of the conceptual part and then we go hands-on and, you know, exercises and then they do a homework and I'm able to get in three hours of exam students building a, automating a process with, let's say, 10, 20 tasks ground up and submitting at the end of the, uh, as an exam, you know, electronic exam. So, uh, uh, yes? Are 
process design in German or design in German? The, the BPM and serialization only really crystallized around the end of 2011, right? Okay. So if you were playing with it in 2011, there would have been a lot of hiccups in there. Okay. Uh, I have experienced that like in the past year, year and a half, I've been managing to uh, push uh, dot, uh, BPM and files between different tools uh, quite, quite nicely. Like uh, maybe I'll do a bit of, of uh, uh, publicity we have a business process model simulator called BIMP. If you type BIMP, B -I -M -P, BIMP simulator on Google, it's the first link. Uh, and uh, that is supports BPMN, right? The standard BPMN. You take a BPMN file and you drop it into BIMP like that. And you get a, a web form where you can fill in the parameters of simulation parameters, all the data you need to simulate, you know, and bang it produces your simulation. Uh, and and, uh, and then we had we did it and we made it interoperate with Signavio. In fact, if you use Signavio Academic Alliance, you can take your model in Signavio and push it to BIMP. And we were very afraid. I even made it a project uh, for a student to support other tools because I said supposedly they are BPMN, but they are not. Uh, it turns out that uh, the student came back and said, "Well, I tried with business process." Uh, logician, which is uh, used to be called uh, Visual Architect, BPVA, and it just works straight away. So I said, well, and he tried a couple of other tools, and it was like, well, then in that case, we have nothing to do, right? Uh, so, so it has been, it has substantially improved in that respect. Something else that, for example, I've tried to do was to export a BPMN diagram from Sagnano at the conceptual level, import it in some of these tools, like, for example, you can import it as is in the IBM BPM, and then you will get as much as that tool can support. Like, for example, data objects will automatically be discarded. And then you can make it executable. Yeah. Uh, okay, so then I can start with that. Yes, yes, yes. That's good. Uh, I have a more technical question about the data bindings. As you said, you said it just about the, it's like uh, uh, if you have some special layer, like how to program it? You generally have some legacy systems, you have legacy databases, and how to synchronize it with uh, these kind of systems. Now, that, that's another question. Now, uh, the, the, the typical, in a, in a three-tier architecture, the business process management system comes typically in the middle tier, right? So, uh, it, it's funny because it, it has its own database because it stores process execution data, right? So, it has its own database. But it's fundamentally a middle tier instrument. So it has business logic and coordination logic. Uh, and uh, <coughs> it communicates with the lower tier, which is the database tier, uh, through, you know, in a, through distributed protocols. Right? So, so as if they were separated, even if they are running the same server, it doesn't matter, but they are separated. So, so, the, so if a business process management system uh, needs to retrieve something from the database, you kind of have to expose, the database has to expose some uh, a service layer, right? Typically, that will be a RESTful interface with crude operations for your entities. And the database will retrieve, uh, the business process management system will make a service call to retrieve data that it needs and put it in its working memory, right? And then it, its working memory, you can think about, about it as a set of variables. So if I need a purchase order, I need to retrieve a purchase order stored in my database. I will have to have a service task to retrieve the purchase order service task that involves the, the crude operations or the query operations in the database, retrieves the purchase orders that you want, if you want several ones, and puts them in a local variable of the business process management system. And, and because of that, actually, that thing is the main motivation for all these people around who are talking about data aware or data centric business processes. They're saying this is not right. You know, you, you, you have a lot of services going around, uh, around the, and you have a, bi a business process model that will have a lot of tasks that are not business tasks. They are just there to, you know, bind uh, the business process layer with the database, right? And and that's maintenance nightmare, etc. you know, and, and that it is better to sort of make data access transparent 
in your uh, in your business process management system. The artifact centric systems like Axi will have the data management layer is embedded together with the business process management system. So the data layer is not present. You only have to use some kind of services like so or stuff. Or rest, yeah. So you you know you retrieve it with HTTP gets or because HTTP puts actually, it. If you're doing something like this, it's maybe more complicated than the program of the system because programming the logic of EPM it's quite short. You only imagine that it's validated by user. Yeah. And uh, if you use every data transaction you you annual program to have this for so you spend more time than just program on the logic of the uh, well, at the same time, there are tools uh, emerging like uh, LinkQ, you know, Microsoft LinkQ, for example, where you take, which is embedded with SQL Server, and you, it allows you to take your <coughs> database and expose it as uh, the, ser the crude operations as services like in three milliseconds with one eye closed, right? So, uh, so, so, the, so it's a trend. It's a trend. This is the, the that was the publicity. Sorry. <laughs> so, so. Uh, that there is a trend that the database has a service integration layer inside. And there are some architects, you know, people you know, who, who kind of prefer that way of working. You know, do not access the database through your JDBC thing with ORM, but, you know, like you use these services that are exposed from the database layer. So, so there is this trend going on there. I was just asking if it's something present like LinkQ layer, because LinkQ actually give you unified access to all database resources uh, using object layer that you can map the data to the object that is used in uh, above logic of the program. So it is not present in these systems. You no, this system will not do it. No. So if you are using SQL Server, you will use Link, expose it, services, crude services, REST. If you use PostgreSQL, for example, nowadays PostgreSQL has everything to expose your stuff as well as services. Um, so, so there is this database as a service trend that, in a way, makes makes it viable to work in this way where the business process management system will be retrieving data. If, if it wasn't for that, I think business process management systems will be kind of dead. If the database as a service stuff hadn't kind of started to emerge, I think uh, business process management systems will be dinosaurs by now, indeed, because you know you have to have like creating a service, uh, you know, in, in in one layer and then exposing a bunch of services and and then binding it with the database, and that will make things very complicated. Right. No further questions. Right. So now I'm going to turn into demo mode. Let me bring a share. So I'm going to show you uh, a demo of business process management sys of Bisagi. Uh, the first thing about Bisagi, I will start by saying things I don't like. First thing is that it doesn't work on Mac. So I have to have a virtual machine inside, right, running Windows. Um, so it's meant to be used in the Windows environment and deploy in Windows servers and, and so on. So that's the first thing, matter of choice. Nobody's perfect. Uh, uh, Bisagi is a business <coughs> process management system. Um, and when they started, they made a very interesting choice, very interesting at the time, right? Which is that uh, as any business process management system, they needed to have a, a business process modeling editor. I have talked that like, you need to define your process, you know, in the business process management system, your to be executed process, and so on. Uh, and they, they kind of had this idea that. Well, now that we have developed this editor, it's sunk cost, we have paid for it. Uh, it costs us nothing to just extract the editor and make it available for free, completely for free. Take it. And then they, uh, through their Bisagi process modeler, so you'll find Bisagi process model that only allows you, it's an editor, a pure editor. Uh, and separately, they had uh, they left their business process management system uh, behind separately. Besides your process modeler, they made it free for anything you want, and that made that it became quite popular because uh, uh, coming up with 
more or less okay process modeling tools for free nowadays is not uh, very obvious uh, and you know uh, and the prices go become very steep so they have because of this decision they have their modeler and their studio but I don't care about the modeler I'm dealing with executable processes at the moment so I'm going to go straight into the studio that's the 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 development environment for business processes uh, which integrates the, the, the process editor um, like in any pro of such tools you will create projects I will create a project called uh, order to cash although I don't think that I will get to the cash part uh, have a resolution problem right I was hoping it will not happen uh, let me try to work with a different resolution uh, so, sorry how do I system preferences can you kind of help me this this place show me the option go to arrangement color no go back by display yeah and you try best for it in a display okay we'll see right thank you I'll see see if I can do this right now I have it sorry for that hiccup so I do next so he's creating the process. Uh, then you will zoom in the, in the I, I will the zoom design. when we need to zoom. Yeah, I will zoom. Okay. So now he's creating a, a particular a database specifically for uh, this project. This is another disadvantage of Visagi is that it stores. Uh, there is a process model. That one is in a, can be exported in a file called .bpm, which is their own proprietary format. You can export it to XPDL as well. But everything that has to do with execution properties uh, is actually stored directly in a bunch of databases, which makes it very difficult to export uh, an executable process model and give it to someone in a, send it by email to someone in a file. There is a procedure for that, but it's like 12 steps and you will get lost. So uh, that's because in teaching, what I do is then that I, uh, my students put Pisagi always in a virtual machine, and they will save and dump the whole virtual machine and give it to me in a memory stick. That's how I will work. So at the end of an exam, I will end up with like uh, 30 memory sticks in my hand, and then uh, I will start grading one by one. So that's the only solution I have found. I, 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 Please share your experiences. You know, don't let me talk all the time because otherwise we'll be here. We'll be uh, finishing ten minutes. Well, maybe that's what you want. <laughs> yeah, that's the procedure that they suggested. Visage has that procedure of, but then to re put it back uh, in your other machine. You know, so you have to follow certain procedures, right? And and certain tables you have to dump, and certain other tables you should not dump, and you know you should reimport. So you have to be careful. But that's a procedure that they essentially are suggesting. Yeah. Mm. When you said that's why I call it adapted BPMN. This was not in the category pure BPMN, but adapted BPMN. So no, no, you cannot import uh, pretty much anything into this. So things. you can export, for example, into XPDL, but you only export the diagram. You don't export everything that goes with that. Yeah. Like, for example, the database that has been created. So you would have to import that and recreate the database in your system. But there are some other tools, like IBM, where you can export a process application it's called and that's a zip containing pretty much everything that you need so yes, some, some tools some tools will do have that flexibility pro yeah. produce a project uh, dump right and that contains everything and you can send it by email and, and stuff but it like depends that. on on the paradigm that has been used 
by the tool. If the data is centralized, then you have to take a dump of the SQL, like an SQL dump of the database. In the case of IBM, it's not centralized, so data is within each solution, so you can export the solution as such, as a project in an archive. Right. So no other experience to tell me, no, no other tricks I should know. Right. So you can install a server with application that can the user use the web on the yeah, server, they, it requires more resources. Yeah, 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 so, and, and 30 students using it at the same time will be a bit of a problem as well. Oh, right. I think yeah. that this actually is uh, designed for even millions of users. Ah, 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 ah. That's what I tell to people. No, don't go wrong. One thing is that a system is designed for millions of end users. Not, and it's not true, by the way. Let's say hundreds of end users. That's one element of scalability. Another one is that it's designed for uh, 40 developers. Right. And that is different. <laughs> the systems are designed like for, you know, a couple of developers, five developers working more or less concurrently and typically even in different, you know, PCs. Yeah, so, so I, I kind of have kind of made that mistake and uh, in some other environment where we... So for even an application server, we have this problem with deploying, say, Glassfish or JBoss, right? JBoss is very scalable, right? Or Glassfish is very scalable. But scaling it to 50 students hitting at the same time, that actually, that's not the type of scalability that it has. Crashes today is because yeah. submission of the assignment. Yeah, in addition, there is this deadline, and students work only the night before the deadline, I have noticed. Process name is, uh, I'll call this order. So I'll create a new process, and uh, the un another thing I tell, not only to students, but also to people who are going to start using it in, in development mode, is like, n do not, when you do business process, let me call it, make a programming, which means making a more or less curable, do not forget principles of software engineering, right? and main principles of engineering that we have learned after 45 years is that you don't try to do everything and then test right so so that's why i tell the students here is a, a, a process model in signavio and they say why did you make it do in signavio if now i have to put in visage i'll say that even if it was in visage i will ask you to take the model print it out put it aside and start again from scratch the students, the only students who have failed my course are those who try to build the model, take the pro model from start to end, and start adding the execution properties everywhere, 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 and then they click and didn't work. And then they spend the whole rest of the exam trying to make it work, and then they crashed, right? So, uh, so, so, just start like this. You, know, you start like every, every, every 2B process model is started one step at a time. Uh, you start by putting a model with the first task, just to say something. Uh, a, I'll call it, uh, can you remind me? Check stock availability. Check stock availability. No, 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 no. Uh, enter PO because I, I don't have a, a, a PO yet, right? Enter the purchase order and then end. And that's it. Normally you have to put names in the events and everything, doesn't matter. This is enough already to get going, right? So we will start, I tell them, start there, make this model executable, test it, and then extend little by little. Therefore, you really do not lose a lot when you use one process modeling tool for modeling and another process modeling tool for execution, even if these two tools don't communicate very well. Because anyway, you have to redo it. And you have to do it incrementally. Yeah. But it is possible to import the uh, model Marcello uh, prepared and then executed, uh, executed, but not the whole process, but from the beginning till the uh, yeah. Point. This is this is unfortunate that uh, a, the business process management systems uh, will actually not most of them the ones that I've seen do not support execution of partially executable models. Okay, activity does. Activity does so that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So. So my, my experience is with activity. You can uh, partially, yeah. Uh, partially. Okay. With, with, uh, when students model the whole process and then try to uh, uh, execute it. Uh, okay, when it's great. completely specified, but if you have unspecified process, unspecified. Specify it, 
He tries his best. Yeah. He tries his, to run until it's best. Uh, right. Yes, yeah, so other tools actually allow to test it, which is not to deploy. It. Like for example, in IBM you can test it directly from the, the, the designer. And it links to the portal, but in test mode, and uh, again, as far as you can go. As far as you can go, yeah. So, Pisagio, unfortunately, doesn't have that feature. Would you possibly try something else that just works up like the hand execution, and like the default execution of yeah. uh, a non instrumented model, and then you start implementing some parts? It would mean that it just goes in with the flow based, based, based on the control flow. There will be some. With, when you get to. Uh, to that part that is instrumented, it executes that more strongly and then continues with, with the part that is not. Yeah, actually, that is actually, that is actually, that is actually what I meant by partially execute, okay. execution of partially executable models. I meant that exactly, that you can really, you know, run through it and, and see everything is doing fine. But an intermediate one will be that it throws an exception, but only when it has to. So uh, it could be two options, right? All right, so thanks for the tip. If I die tonight, I will die less ignorant. Right. Um, uh, yes. Uh, so the next thing is, uh, and the, is to have a data model, right? Uh, this is the working memory of the process. This is the, the variable. So in some, in, in, uh, in Visage, that will be a, an entity relationship model, right? So I will, I will have to begin with one entity called PO, and in that PO I will put a few attributes, uh, for example, uh, the product that is being ordered, which is a string, the amount, which is, uh, uh, let's make it, yeah, I can make a currency, but I'll make it integer to make my life la easier later, uh, and uh, product amount is enough to start, right? I mean, you won't blame me if I only start with this one, right? Very simple. And I click on finish. Okay, uh, I have to delete this one right. Finish. So I got my, my data model here. Uh, do you want to save the diagram changes? Yes. So I think I have a data model for this thing. Uh, uh, now, one thing. I didn't say maybe it was important uh, when I show you the the process model. I'll show it again here. Um, is that if if in a task I do not specify what type of task is it is in besides is by default the user task, which means the data collection is supported by the BPMS and for that I need to define a form. Right. So I, I will. Uh, go into defining the forms for my for each of my user tasks. In this case, I only have one task, and it's a user task. And there is a typical uh, form uh, a based uh, a form builder, right? Typical form builder. There's nothing special in here. Um, I think I am done here. If he lets me click, yeah, yes. Uh, do you want to say the forms? Surely yes. Uh, so I'm done for this one. The next step uh, uh, will be uh, uh, to define the business rules. Uh, to I'll come back to this when we have an ex uh, branch condition conditional point. We don't have yet one, uh, and then uh, defining the performers, uh, the roles. In this case, uh, for the moment, I will leave these tasks without assigning to any role, and that means that anyone can execute it. So I'm going to leave the roles aside. So that, that's a nice feature that you can leave it aside. Uh, and I can uh, uh, run the process. Uh, sometimes it's, uh, it doesn't want me to run the process if I have not uh, clicked a bit everywhere. Let me see. Uh, there are no expressions to define. Uh, I have already defined a performance, but I don't want to define that performer. I leave it blank on purpose. I don't want uh, integration. So I can now run the process. So sometimes it just wants you to, to see the screens. You should screen once so that you are sh sure that you have done, you have not forgotten something, and then it allows you to click on run. Yeah. Yeah. That's a small tip for if one day you see the run button blocked, you know, just go again through the wizard and it will be okay. 
Uh, so I, I go to the administration console, which also uh, is acts as the as the monitoring tool because I can generate the dashboards here. So not no point in doing it because I haven't executed anything. Uh, so I can start a case of this process. This this is the the URL of that process. Every process gets its own URL when you deploy it, right? So this is the order to cache application that gives me access to uh, the administration console of that process. Uh, so I can enter a product and I can enter an amount and I can uh, move the process to the next uh, task uh, which means that uh, there's no next task so it's, it's finished right there's nothing to be done I can leave it like that yeah. uh, and then I'll go forward and let's go a little bit quicker uh, I'll do the check stock availability And uh, this is not an easy one, so I have to take a deep breath. This is a service task. So I mark it as a service task. And I'm going to invoke a web service if I can. But uh, to invoke a web service, I need to have the, the enough variables to give input to the service and get output from the service. So I'll define one more attribute of the purchase order. Um, this service is going to check if a product is available, let's say. So I'm going to introduce a boolean to store the fact whether the product is available or not. So I'll add uh, a is available as a boolean here. Boolean. Finish. Right. Close. Right, I don't need to define forms for this new task. I don't need to define any branching conditions or all the rules for the time being. I don't need to define performance because it's a service task. Performance is related to, to user tasks. Uh, but I need to define the integration interfaces. I mean, for every service task and for every uh, message event or send or receive event, I have to define the, the, the integration points. So, so just at night, after a few drinks, I ask myself, but what service I'm going to call, right? So quite a few drinks actually so so I, I kind of started looking for it uh, and uh, Visagi has one on their website if my wireless connection is working hopefully they have one in their website uh, which is an office supply web service so I'm pointing to the service let me see if I have internet connection to retrieve the window it retrieved the window of that service and uh, it has three operations and I kind of found that this one was quite convenient it's called verify vendor rather than stock availability check but I thought this is good enough for the demo so I'll take that one and now I have to define my input and output mapping uh, you notice that for a user task I didn't have to define the input and output mapping because in, in Visagi the, the input and output mapping for the for a user task is automatically inferred from the form. When I define the form, uh, I say that uh, these attributes are editable and these attributes are not editable, so immediately knows what are the input and output parameters required for that task. But for service tasks, I have to do the job, right? I have to say, these are the variables of the process, this is the data model of the process, uh, and this is the, the, the signature of this uh, a, a, a service operation, so I have to relate them. Uh, I have a guy, a product which is a string, and this guy is asking me for four strings. So to make my life simpler, I'll just put these everywhere. Right. Next. Uh, then the output mapping, right? Uh, this is the output that this service gives me, which is a monster. Uh, in verify vendor response, yeah. Vendor status. And vendor status is a boolean, so I say that oh, this is great. I need a boolean, so I'll grab that one and I'll put it in my uh, is available. Right. And uh, then there are what happens if there is a, a, a soap fault coming back, an exception, uh, and there you can grab the output uh, and put it in some boolean variable 
in your uh, uh, process. And, uh, or you can put uh, fixed error messages that you will put. I will, put, I will try with error right now, see if I'm lucky, just putting a constant value in there. Otherwise, you have to put an path expression over the message that you get back, which means I need to know what are the names of the attributes in there. So uh, I better leave it there. Fingers crossed it will work. And I can uh, run it. <coughs> okay. So I enter a product and I enter an amount and uh, I say next and it's calling a web service in Colombia and it says that the processing was successful. I, um, I, I need to add more tasks to see if it was really successful, huh? you will argue. Right. So I'll do a last part. What, yeah? What is happening if the service was not available? It will stop before running or uh, it, it, I get a, I'm in a browser so it gives me a screen saying soap uh, error blah 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 actually it's not a soap if it was a soap error it will use if it was a soap proper soap fault it will put uh, the value in the boolean variable that I will have indicated earlier but uh, if it's like a system fault it will just show you the dump like uh, say like uh, I did it this morning and the internet connection was not good and it couldn't connect and it tell me like uh, connection time it out right no. uh, so I'll, I'm going to add um, uh, another task here a gateway now right I'm, I'm coming I'm calling it for troubles every time right and one of after a while is is going to my lock is going to stop. Uh, then uh, check raw materials availability. Check raw materials availability or, or end. Let me be incremental. What, what happens in the positive case, sorry? That you keep going with check raw materials availability. If, if it is available, if stock yes. is available? If it is not available, you can terminate by notifying the customer. Or to make it simple, you can just finish that. I can finish, right? Check stock availability. Yeah. If not available, I finish. Yeah. If it's available, I... Right. Okay, so this is the true and this is the false, right? So I, this time I, I put a gateway, so I have to go and define the business rules for it. And I need to def instrument this task, uh, check raw materials availability. So yes, save me this. And I probably need to specify something for this. Time. So data model, um, I don't think I need more, right? Not really. I can define the form for uh, this uh, task, check raw materials availability. Uh, I'm going to put in uh, everything I have, which is product and uh, is available, uh, just to know. And uh, I will say that it's not editable. Ed editable. So these are read-only fields. Right. So I think this is good enough for that form for the time being. Closing, yes. And I need now to go to the business rules. There are two types of business rules, actually, in Visage. There are the so-called expressions, or let me call it branching conditions, that you attach to every arc that comes out of an XOR or, or, or gateway and there are uh, action uh, rules which are um, like event action uh, actions that you can trigger when you enter a task or when you exit a task so on enter and on exit rules but you know here I only need to define the expressions I don't need to I, don't, I am not in need of defining any uh, a action rule at the moment so uh, there is a, as usual there will be a, you have to write an expression and there is a, this uh, a, a mapper that allows you to take uh, variables from the uh, data model parameters of the data model and uh, 
you know, say, I want to say, for example, if PO dot is available is true, then I, I take that flow and I check for raw materials availability. So finish. And I can add several conditions in there, make ands and ors. And this, this one, um, I'll say it's an else. I will not write the condition, but instead, uh, this is a tip, by the way, to say it's an else, you first cancel, don't write a condition, and then it asks you, do you want to make it an else? And then it works. So then it's an else. Right. Not very intuitive. <laughs> right. Um, a, I define the performer for this task. And uh, a, here you add allocation conditions, you know, that tells you to whom you allocate it. Uh, uh, and you can say, like, this task will be allocated to a user if this condition is true. And the condition can be directly on the user ID, but that's very unusual, uh, or on the uh, where is he located in the company, or roles, or skills, etc. So I'll say roles, and if the role equals to uh, a, one of the roles that you select, then this will be it. I will create a new role called clerk. I guess so, right? Save. Uh, okay. Select clerk. Oh yeah, I still have to select clerk. Couldn't he do it for me, right? Okay. So roles equal. So any user whose roles equals clerk is it. Roles is actually a set, but when you write roles equals a value, then it's understood that you know that value is in that set. After a while, you understand it. Okay. <coughs> Uh, I already defined my integration interfaces and I think I'm ready to execute except that I do not have any clerks yet but the administrator of the console can play the role of any of the users so I'm going to play with that so I'll start a case, new case and now again, da 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 da, the two is calling the web service again. It returned, and uh, it immediately uh, because there is no clerk, it couldn't assign the task to any uh, participant. Then it assigned it to the administrator. That's the default behavior. And besides, it has this nice auto chaining. Uh, auto chaining I call it a uh, feature that if a performer perform a task finishes it and there is another task in the same uh, uh, process instance that it also goes to that same user he just changes it behind and I'm seeing now the form that the clerk should see yeah. so yes it was available right <laughs> Uh, and I could keep going, but I guess that uh, uh, maybe we, we should leave some time for questions or something specific you want me to show. Um, next, uh, uh, and I can go and see, by the way, uh, all the closed cases, and I will see the ones that I just performed. And there are analysis reports. I talked about this BAM, which is like, viewing the current execution status of the process and process analytics, which is viewing history, right? So process bound will probably not give me anything interesting because there is no work in progress at the moment. In addition, I have to install Adobe Flash, right? That's not nice. And process analytics will tell me that I have completed three uh, processes in the last uh, three minutes. So loading charts for three instances, that takes a long time. Uh, things that I didn't show you uh, in here that maybe are worth knowing. Uh, in the integrate option, you can interface with services, SOAP or REST, or uh, you can bind your receive events or your receive tasks to ports, uh, you know, like service ports, and then that way another application can call you, and that call, that, that event will, will become the occurrence of that message event in your process system. So that's that's one feature I didn't uh, show. And uh, and then uh, uh, the, the users are defined in the administration console that I kind of, uh, that has somehow disappeared. 
the administration console uh, will have a, a admin stuff and you can add users and uh, and when you add a user, you can say its organizational roles and so on. You can specify them there. Right. So that's it for this uh, tutorial. 